Now, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California presents... Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Joseph Cotton as star of Beyond Good and Evil, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Mr. Joseph Cotton in Beyond Good and Evil by Ben Hecht and Douglas Whitney in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! By Dr. Pierce, good evening. Good evening, Mary. Is Dr. McKillop still awake? Oh, yes. We don't put him to bed until eight or later. Hmm. Is evening service over already? For a shame, Mary. A parson's housekeeper. And you forget we don't hold service on Wednesdays? Why, it slipped my mind it was Wednesday, sir. Uh, of course, you've come to read to Dr. McKillop. He'll be so pleased. There's so little I can do. If he were able to let us know in some way... I can tell by his eyes, sir. Whenever you're here, they, they fairly glow. Well, I suppose... That helpless as he is, not able to speak or even write, my visits are at least a diversion. You? You're more than a diversion, sir. You're his, his hope, if I may say so. No, Mary. The Lord is his hope. Oh, yes, sir. The Lord struck him down with paralysis. And in time, the Lord will surely free him from it. Uh, where is the doctor? In his study, sir. We leave him there until bedtime. Very well. I'll go in for an hour or so. Stay as long as you like, Dr. Pierce. We won't disturb you. Dr. McKillop, it's Dr. Pierce come to read to you. Good evening, Dr. McKillop. Good evening. Good evening, good evening. <laughs> You're a most satisfying companion, McKillop. You hang on my every word and you never talk back. Never but once. And after tonight, you won't get the chance, so... Speak up, Doctor. Why don't you? No? Oh. <laughs> of course, the, uh, the cat's got your tongue. <laughs> well, I'll turn up the lights a bit so I can at least bask in your baleful stare. Yeah, that's better, much better. Yes. Tonight is your last chance, McKillop. Tonight is the consummation, the grand finale, the end. Act three curtain on a great play about death redemption about good and evil and I won't shrink from your eyes tonight McKillop your eyes can't kill but I can kill I have the mind and the will and the hands I've killed one man you know that and tonight I'm going to kill again no reading from the good book tonight doctor no more metaphysics now. I'm going to tell you a story. Much of it is ancient history to you, but I think there's enough new to hold your interest. I know it'll hold my interest because I enjoy talking about myself. Well, you already know I killed a man. You know who he was. And you even know who I was before I became Dr. Howard Pierce, pastor of this good and godly community. At least you know the name, Philip Gentry. But you never knew the soul of Philip Gentry, Doctor. The contempt, the sum of evil that was in me the night it all began. That was three months ago. A, a stormy night, as you remember. And where was I? I was crouching in a swamp with a man named Mac. Because we had just escaped from prison, hiding like an animal in a deep mud and ooze, alien from the whole human race. Gentry. Jeffy, where are you going? To the highway, fool. We have to get out of this mud and make time. But Pete's back there in the swamp. You can't leave him. Why not? We gotta all stick together. He'll die back there. Listen, we took equal chances when we made this break. I'm not taking extra chances for anyone. 
Better make time before daylight and before the rain stops. They'll bring out dogs in the morning. Dogs? Uh, okay, okay, you're the boss. There's a the highway now, beyond the fence. Okay, so what do we do now? Where do we go? We split up. Split? But, Gentry, shouldn't we stick together? We split up. I go my way, you go yours. I'll meet you in Chicago later. At Tony's place? At Tony's place. In two or three weeks, when the manhunt cools off. Okay. Okay, we'll make a great team, you and me. We'll make them suckers scream. Chicago. And then maybe South America. All right, Max. Save the dreaming for later, right now. You get moving. Now go on, fast. <laughs> He headed north. I walked a mile or more, this way, south. And then I saw the car. It was parked close to the edge of the road, its headlight almost blacked out by the driving rain. And by the glow of the flashlight, I saw a man bending into the rain, struggling to change a tire. He was alone, so I walked up to him. Oh, oh, you startled me. I didn't expect to see anyone out so late. You picked a bad night for a flat. Yes, it's the second today. I'm going to be awfully late. Here, here, let me... Oh, no, no, but if, if you'd hold the light... Sure. Come a long way? Yeah, from Detroit. I'm on my way to Carlton. I was supposed to get there this afternoon. At your home, Carlton? Well, it will be. I'm the new minister there. My name's Pierce. Oh, oh of, of course. I, I didn't notice you were a preacher. Do you know Carlton? Well, uh, pretty well. I'm taking over for old Dr. McKillop at Grace Church. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of him. He's been in bad health, so I'm taking his place. My, this, this bolt is stubborn. I can't seem to get it. Here, here, let me try. No, 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 I'll manage if I can uh, just... Give me the wrench. No, really, just hold the light. I said give me the wrench. <laughs> well, all right, it's awfully good of you, but... Oh, wait, what are you doing? I need your car, Dr. Pierce. <laughs> You're going to be even later than you thought. No, please! Please, don't hit me. No, no, help! Let me see your license, buddy. My license? Oh, oh, yes, I, 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 I have it here, 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 here it is. Mm -hmm. Howard Pierce, occupation. Oh, minister, I, I didn't notice. Yes, but what is it? Was I speeding? No, no, we were checking all cars on this road. There was a break at the state pen, three men. Uh, they might come this way. Oh, I see. Oh, but I won't hold you any longer, Reverend. You're going far? No, to uh, Carlton. <laughs> oh, now I get it. Well, Imagine me not catching on right away. Catching on? Sure. You must be the new preacher for Grace Church, taking Dr. McKillop's place. Why, yes, I am. Uh, you're going to the parsonage now? I was. Well, well I, I'm going I thought... to headquarters now, and uh, I have to go right by Dr. McKillop's house. You follow me. Oh, I, I couldn't impose Oh, it. it's not out of my way at all, not more than a block. I'll go slow so you can't lose me. Huh? Okay? Well, uh, all right. Ah, oh, that's the ticket. Really tickle old Dr. McKillop. Have you delivered right to his door? Say, I bet you never counted on this kind of reception in Carlton, Reverend Pierce. <laughs> now, did you? No, I, I certainly didn't, my son. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Mr. Joseph Cotton in Beyond Good and Evil by Ben Hecht and Douglas Whitney. Roma Wine's presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Here's a suggestion from the internationally renowned hostess, Elsa Maxwell, who says this about smart and gracious hospitality. Next time you entertain, flatter your guests by serving glorious gold and amber Roma California Sherry. Perfect before dinner, perfect at any time. A most delightful wine of light, nut-like taste. Serve cool. From California's choicest vineyards come the carefully selected wine grapes for distinguished Roma Sherry and all fine Roma wines. Remember... Good Roma wines never vary in fine quality, are always pleasing, the happy result of selected grapes, carefully picked at their peak of flavor goodness, 
gently pressed, then unhurriedly guided to perfection by the ancient skill of Roma's famed wineries. Yes, good Roma wines are always delicious, yet cost only pennies a glass. Remember, because of uniformly fine quality at reasonable cost, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Joseph Cotton as Philip Gentry in Beyond Good and Evil, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. So that was it. My arrival in your dull, pleasant town of Carlton, remember? Officer Owens and your very beautiful daughter escorted me into your study. Father, Mr. Owens brought Dr. Pierce. Dr. Pierce, oh, come in, come in. Uh, you and Mr. Owen wait outside for a few minutes, Lucy. Yes. Okay. All right, Father. Let's sit over here, Dr. Pierce. I can't tell you how relieved I am to see you. I, uh, I'm relieved to finally be here, Dr. McKellar. Yes, well... I really couldn't bring myself to sleep tonight without first talking to you. You see, the situation's serious. Serious? My health. I'm a sick man. I've had one stroke, as you know. Oh, yes. Yes, you wrote. Yes. Well, I could have another one at any minute. The doctor says a worse one. And I feel it essential that the work of the parish is in firm hands. This parish needs a young man. Well, I hope to be of service. I've heard only good of you, Dr. Pierce. And you know, you're even younger than you looked. Than I looked? In the picture you sent. Darker, too. Your hair... I'm afraid it wasn't a good likeness. I have the picture here, somewhere on my desk. With uh, your letters. What did you want to talk to me about, Dr. McKillop? Oh, all the work of the parish. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Here's the photograph. It's... It's... Dr. Pierce. Is there something wrong, Dr. McKillop? It's not... Uh, who are you? This isn't your picture. Who are you? I don't think that would interest you, Dr. McKillop. Something's happened to Dr. Pierce. What did you do to him? You're... What do you think I did, Dr. McKillop? Oh... Go on, guess. Guess. Yes. Don't play with me, you sanctimonious fool. Speak up. Speak. Uh... Speak. Oh, brother, don't tell me. Don't tell me you've had a stroke. You you can't speak, is that it? Uh, yeah. Well, I'll find out. I'll take uh, that picture, Dr. McKillop. Now, if you don't... Dr. Pierce, we thought uh, we Yes, Miss Lucy, something's happened to your father. We were talking and all oh, of a sudden... Oh, say, he's sick. Uh, I'll call the doctor, Miss Lucy. Yes, please, Mr. Owen. Yeah, is it's it... another stroke. He can't speak, apparently can't move. Oh, father. Father, what can we do? We'll have to wait for the doctor. Maybe even then. I know the doctor said he could be paralyzed for months, years, but he mustn't die. No, no, I'm sure the Lord will spare him if we have faith. Yes. Look, look, he can hear us, see his eyes. I see. It's a blessing you got here tonight, Dr. Pierce, a blessing you are going to stay. Well, I... Oh, but I, you uh, must. Well, I wasn't sure, but since this has happened to your father, yes, I'll stay. I hope I prove worthy. <laughs> Dear friends, you may wonder that I chose this subject for my first sermon to you, The Agony of the Thief. It is no wonder, for as I spoke to you of such a man, a thief beaten, outcast, and alone, I spoke at the same time of each of us, from the mighty to the fallen, of that substance which we all share our human dignity as beings made in the image of God. Remember the agony of our Lord who shared by two thieves, crucified beside him, that he might be numbered among the transgressors. And remember his words to one, verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. We will sing him 426. O oh God, our help in ages past. My first sermon, Dr. McKillop, and it was duck soup for me. You couldn't understand how such a thing could be done without faith. 
Well, you didn't know I'd been a lawyer. I've done a lot without faith, McKillop. It doesn't take such a holy man to care for your sheep. From the first day until now, I've been the ideal parson. Even the day I got that call from young Hubbard. Yes, I played the part. Oh, I, I forget that this is all news to you. you. You didn't know about that, about the conversation I had with young Hubbard in the study of the church. Dr. Pierce? Yeah? I, uh, I missed your first service, Sunday, Doctor. Hmm. I thought I'd pay you a call. Well, I'm glad you did. Sit down. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name's Hubbard. I work at the bank, First National. I'm Chief Teller. That's a very responsible job for a young man. Oh, I don't know. I suppose it is, but well, I don't have much more responsibility than the other tellers, except at the end of the month. Then it's a strain. The end of the month? Well, sure. Well, that's when I... Well, you know, I've never told anyone about this, so even with you... Oh, Mr. Hubbard, it's confidential. I... Oh, naturally, not so far as you're concerned, Dr. Pierce. You see, the 30th of the month, we move all our deposits to the Federal Reserve Bank. Mm. $50,000 or more. Mm. Well, you can see how I wouldn't want some people to know that. You mean you would take the deposits uh, alone? Oh, no, that'd be even worse than it is. Uh, there's an armored truck comes to take the money. Comes by around 9.30 at night. But I'm alone in the bank until it gets there. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes when I'm sitting there at my desk, I, I think how easy it would be. Mm. All someone would have to do is shoot me through the glass door. You see what I mean? Faith McKillop. <laughs> God never sendeth mouth, but he sendeth meat. Out of all this community's 35,000 souls, Hubbard chose me to share that secret. Sent a letter that night to Mac, care of Tony's in Chicago. As you can see, Mac, the setup is simple and foolproof. If you do as I say, leave Tony's now. Hide out until till the 28th of June, then head this way. Case the job first because you must be at the bank not later than 9 p.m. on the 30th. Yours, Gentry. That meant two months to wait, two months until the death of young Hubbard. Two months until I had $50,000 in a clear getaway. Two months until tonight. Two pleasant months to play a saintly part, warmed by adulation, warmed by love because even you could see what was happening to your daughter, your very beautiful daughter, Lucy. Dr. Pierce, do you ever think of anything besides your work? I don't know, Lucy. What sort of things? Well, do you ever think of yourself, of a full life for yourself? Why, of course. That's why I work. My work gives me a full life. Uh, you don't know what I mean. Yes, I think I do. You see, I have to tell you even if you don't want to hear. Uh, Lucy, my dear, I, I... have to tell you that I love you, Howard. I know I can't expect that to mean much to you. It means a great deal. Not enough. Lucy, dear, you told me once that you were engaged to someone. Yes, I'm... I'm supposed to be. Tom's all right, but... he's little and unimportant and afraid. He's afraid to dare anything, to do anything. He's meek. The meek shall inherit the earth. You don't believe that, Howard Pierce. Even if you are a parson, you don't believe it. What do I believe, Lucy? I don't know exactly. But when I first saw you, I knew that you were like me. You have boldness and strength. You, you, you have an inward feeling about life. I let it ride. There wasn't any harm in that, Doctor, so far as I could see. Lucy was a great help, blinded by what she called love. And what did I feel? Love? Doctor, a man who has mastered the use of words as I have no longer knows what they mean, but only what they do. With Lucy, so long as the word love served me, I used it. After a while, it became a source of danger. That was last week, Wednesday, when I came in the evening to read to you. Howard. Howard, the most wonderful news, guess. How can I guess? Don't you know? The most wonderful thing that could ever happen to no, us. what's that, Lucy? Well, I've never breathed a word to Father about us because you asked me not to. Mm -hmm. Not until he can talk to us and give yeah. his blessing. Lucy, you didn't... No, no, not yet. But the doctor was here today, and he told me Father will speak again mm -hmm. soon, any day now. No, no. He doesn't know why he hasn't already. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, yes, yes, it is. Ho Howard, what's the matter? Nothing's the matter. But there is. I can see that well, you... Oh, uh, sit down, Lucy. All right, Howard. I was going to tell you before, my dear. You see... Well, I can't marry you. Not ever. You can't... Now, please, you mustn't ask me why. 
It doesn't matter why. Do you understand? It's because you don't love me. If you have to believe that, all right. Only you must go on and live your life as though you never met me. As though I never met you. Do you know what that means? Whatever it means. It means I'll marry Tom. It means I'll have a little, quiet, secure life. The best life for you, Lucy. Tom. Tom, in place of you. Well, maybe you're right. I won't ever have great happiness with him, but after this, I'll never have a greater unhappiness. You mustn't be bitter, Lucy. If you hadn't known me, you would have married your Tom, and you would have loved him. All right. All right, I will marry him. I'll marry him this week in church, and you'll perform the service, Howard. You'll be the one to make me Mrs. Tom Hubbard. Who did you say? Tom Hubbard. I'll be a banker's wife. I... I never knew his name before. Well, no matter what you think, Lucy, I'm sure you'll be happy. Don't ask me why I didn't kill you, Dr. McKellop, when I heard that you might speak now at any time. I can still smother you with a pillow and no one would know. I suppose killing always was distasteful to me, a job for cruder minds. It isn't because of any moral scruples, believe me. And don't you believe, Doctor, that ethics had any part in what I did about Lucy either? Not for one minute. It was just that I wanted my hands free for this last week. It was just that I believe in leaving a place tidy, no loose ends. If it happens that my neat habits turn in a good deed now and then, that doesn't make me a boy scout. After all, if, if I were a higher being like you, I... I might be upset by thinking of such things as, uh, uh, oh, killing Lucy's husband tonight, Tom Hubbard, as he sits at his desk at the bank. Here it is, the 30th, and I've got a very important date in half an hour. Well, Doctor, did that interest you? Now that you know the real Philip Gentry, do you understand? I doubt it. I doubt if you, with your good book in your hymnal, your years of tending the good sheep in the rich green pastures here could ever understand one-tenth of what a man like me feels, and is. It doesn't matter. I don't need your understanding. Good night, Doctor. And sleep well. Good night, Dr. Pierce. Will you drop in tomorrow? Tomorrow? Well, we'll, we'll see about tomorrow. We'll see. <laughs> It's Dr. Pierce, Tom. Let me in. Oh, doctor. Just a minute. I, I wanted to make sure. You, you see, this is the night when the truck's supposed yes, to come Yes, I, I remembered. That's how I knew where to find you, Tom. Did you, you want something? Lucy is feeling sick. I came to send you home. Lucy? Oh, but I can't. I have to stay. I, I can stay for you. Oh, gee, I don't know. I'm supposed to stay. Lucy but... is calling for you, Tom. She's really sick? Well, all right. I guess with you here, it'll be all right. Just, just tell me what to do. Well, that's the money already in those sacks. Yes. And I sit here? Uh, yes, right at this desk. Mm -hmm. Well, gee, I don't know what the directors will think. Run along now, Tom. They'll never know why. <laughs> Even if someone walks by from the outside, they'll never know if it's you or me sitting here. Got him right through the head. Ah, he ought to have that money already, right near him. Mac. Huh? What? Who's there? Mac. Come here, Mac. Ch Gentry! Yes. It's Gentry, Mac. What? Something screwy here. You sent me a letter. I know. I didn't have a chance to tell you. The plans were changed, Mac. Gentry. Honest, Gentry, I didn't mean to I know, to I know. You'd better go. I'm dying, Mac. Nah, nah, I ain't gonna leave you here. What do you think I yes, am? Yes, yes, you are. They won't get me, Mac. I'm, I'm dying. You go on now. Only you won't be able to take the money. Huh? The plan is all changed. Okay, okay, that don't matter. The dough. Remember... Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. 
What? What are you talking about? That's from the Bible, Mac. You wouldn't know it, I guess. It's from the Bible. It was said by a thief. <laughs> This, dear friends, was the man, Philip Gentry, or Dr. Pierce, or whatever other name he may choose in eternity. The man whom we bury today. That night when he stood above my bed, pouring defiance and bitterness into my ears, thinking that I was paralyzed, I could both speak and write. My paralysis had been gone for many days, but I did not speak because I knew what Philip Gentry would do, what he had to do. I knew what he denied, that to accomplish work as he had in God's vineyard, a man must have faith, even though he denied that faith. That is why, in spite of all, he protected my daughter's happiness. That is why he could not kill me for the work he did here had molded him in spite of himself into a man who was truly a servant of God. To such a man, our Lord would say, Verily, I say unto you, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Roma Wines have brought you Joseph Cotton, a star of Beyond Good and Evil. Tonight's study in Suspense. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines, the sponsor of Suspense. Autumn makes me think of ducks on the wing, says famed hostess Elsa Maxwell, and ducks make me think of Roma California Burgundy. Roma Burgundy because it's a robust wine for a robust time of the year. So delicious with the savory foods of fall, ducks, stew, beef, or spaghetti. I find Roma Burgundy, served cool, makes food so much more enjoyable. Try Roma Burgundy with dinner tomorrow. You'll enjoy the tart piquancy and fruity taste of this Vintner's masterpiece. Yes, like all Roma wines, this is wine at its best in uniform quality. For Manhattan Magic or a perfect martini, use Roma Vermouth, the better vermouth that makes better cocktails, made and bottled in sunny California. Enjoy Roma wines of fine quality every day, now featured at new low prices by leading wine merchants everywhere. Joseph Cotton appeared to the courtesy of David O. Selznick, producer of Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound. Next Thursday, you will hear Mr. Henry Fonda, as star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.